Welcome to Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Carlos Correa. On the program, Dr. Diana Bustamante, Executive Director of the Colonias Development Council, and Carlos Marentes, Executive Director of the Border Farm Workers Center. We'll talk to them about the hardships faced by many migrant farm worker youth. Plus, we'll discuss the film, The Harvest, which sheds a light on farm worker rights in the area of labor, education, health, and housing issues. But first, several students with migrant seasonal farm worker backgrounds are getting a chance to share their recent experiences with co-op, study abroad, and research projects offered through CAMP, which stands for College Assistance Migrant Program at New Mexico State University. Tony Bobadilla keeps busy no matter what he's doing. I've been doing a lot of rehabilitation services for the mentally ill. I've been doing a lot of behavioral modification services for children that are diagnosed as oppositional or defiant. And I've been doing a lot of intakes with high schoolers. It's hard to believe, but all that effort is part of Bobadilla's schoolwork as he plans for his future. Once he graduates, Bobadilla wants to pursue a career in therapy because his heart is all in social work. I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot of human behavior when I've learned a lot of, I've learned a lot of diagnosis, a lot of how the medication helps the diagnosis, how it affects the person. I learned a lot of um, different, like I said, different human behaviors. I've learned a lot of interventions. And all that learning was made possible through CAMP, New Mexico State University's College Assistance Migrant Program. It's a federally funded project helping migrant or seasonal farm worker students attend college. They help a lot and not only um, financial wise, but they're always here with an open door to give um, advice, to give support, to guide us through any issues that we're facing as far as academic wise or even personal wise. They're here always with a smile. Um, camp has been here to help us overall. I mean, in the past three and a half years that I've been here, camp has been the first point, the first stop that I go to. And being here in the camp office, that's it gives us that feeling of family. You know, we have that comfort with each other because we are from the same background. More than a dozen students created poster projects filled with activities and newly acquired skills they developed through their own individual internships. It's their opportunity to show the NMSU community about the work they've done, about the experiences they've had um, outside the university, and it's to help us kind of um, make the, make um, others understand kind of what our program is all about and how we support our students in endeavors such as this. The Camp Poster Expo highlights months of research and allows students to share their interests with not just other students but the entire community. It helps them because it exposes them to certain elements of their education and they get to kind of take it with the research of course it helps them become more um, developed in terms of what they want to study here at school and it also exposes them to different things. If they're not sure kind of what road they want to take, it, if they go outside of the country, it's helped them kind of form their, um, their goals for life, their goals here at NMSU, and helps them really think about what they want to do because they've had experiences and they come back usually and they want to do something really big. Pamela Prieto is a junior at New Mexico State University. She was born in Mexico and never thought she would be this close to receiving a college diploma. Prieto says she runs into many challenges, but none she can't handle. It's a challenge, yeah, you know, like every day, even the terms that they say, like myself in accounting, they sometimes they say terms that I don't know. So I have to go to the dictionary and, and then translate. So in order for me to understand the concept better, it is a challenge, but I think um, it's a, something that at least employees um, are going to be like grateful because you're bilingual, you have um, two different perspectives. Returning from an internship in Spain gives Prieto the advantage over other applicants seeking work. She says employers are usually impressed by the amount of experience a student picks up in programs outside of the classroom. I feel that after I came back, like, it was different for me, like, I was more open mind. I had to, I really um, relate with um, a lot of students from the U.S., so I think I have like a lot of contacts now. And um, my occasional life, well, like it's employers that have a look at my resume tell me that it's a great experience and they prefer students that are also like 
involved in other things, just not focus only in their academics, just like doing maybe community service and starting abroad is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity indeed and a lot of students can benefit from it. I'd like to welcome this week's guests to Fronteras, Dr. Diana Bustamante, Bustamante and Carlos Marentes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, let's start off, I know you both work for different organizations, but uh, do f f uh, similar work. Uh, Dr. Bustamante, can you start with what your organization does? Yes, uh, I work for the Colonas Development Council, which is actually just three blocks away from the university. Uh, we provide community organizing support, leadership development, civic engagement opportunities for colonial communities in Doña Ana County. And Carlos, what does your organization do? My organization is uh, the Centro de los Trabajadores Agrícolas Fronterizos, the Farm Workers Center, located in El Paso, Texas in the recruitment site for farm workers for, for this border region. Uh, the Farm Workers Center uh, mission is to support the, both the migrant and seasonal agriculture workers of the region. Uh, uh, as you know, we have from 5,000 to 12,000 agriculture workers in the area, depending on the month of the year, the majority of whom are from uh, El Paso area from uh, southern New Mexico. So we have the center to uh, support them in any way we can. Now let's set the stage for, uh, for our viewers. Tell me in your own words, how would you describe a farm worker and what are some of the challenges that you think farm workers face? Well, the Colonial Development Council started as the Farm Worker Organizing Project, and in fact, Carlos Marentes worked very closely with the co-founders over 23 years ago. Um, and the concern then was with uh, the housing, health, education, and labor conditions of farm workers in this area. So that's, that's, that's the, the, the beginning of the Colonial Development Council. And you can say a little bit more in terms of the current um, uh, definitions because definitions of uh, farm workers vary from state to state in terms of protections, in terms of uh, types of work that are being done. Yes, and then <coughs> the conditions of the farm workers of a of region are very bad in comparison to the conditions of farm workers in other agriculture areas of the country, the West Coast, the Northwest, the New England area. Uh, uh, most of the farm workers work in, in Doña Ana and Luna County. And the salaries that they receive are very low. Actually, the average annual income for farm workers in this area is less than $6,000 a year, not even close to the federal poverty income guidelines. Uh, plus, they suffer, uh, you know, really uh, shameful working conditions in the fields. Some right now, there's the, the onion harvest is going on, and you go to fields uh, not far from uh, Las Cruces, where farm workers are not provided drinking water. There's no toilet facilities in the fields, uh, despite the fact that the state mandates certain. Uh, certain health and safety standards in agriculture. You go to Luna County, for example, especially in the, near the Columbus and the Deming area, and you see farm workers earning uh, the, uh, from 35 to $40 a day for a long day of work picking uh, harvesting onions. So the conditions are very bad. It's, uh, the situation of farm workers uh, in this area are, you know, are a disgrace. And Carlos, um, why are farm workers important to our communities in southern uh, New Mexico and, and in El Paso? Well, farm workers, uh, and not only the farm workers from our area, but farm, the four, four million farm workers in this country are the ones that produce the food that uh, feed us all, you know. They are the ones that produce the food that, you know, that goes to, to our table. They uh, also, they, they provide a very important contribution to our economy. Uh, in the case of New Mexico, and especially southern New Mexico, the chili production, the onion, the pecan, are very important for the economy of the state. And, and, that, and those industries are based on human beings, 
on people who every day work at midnight, uh, I mean, wake up at midnight to travel to the fields to pick the products that keep, that are a very important element of our economy. And obviously, I, I realize you said a really important job that these farm workers have. Uh, Dr. Bustamante, why do you think um, they're treated the way they are? Well, I think that historically, farm workers have been um, marginalized from the mainstream society. Uh, we have a whole history of bringing in uh, agricultural workers from other countries, not just from Mexico, but from other countries, uh, to do the work that many Americans do not want to do. Uh, but because um, of the hard conditions, because of the low wages, we find people that come to, to, to do this desperate work because it, it fulfills an economic necessity of those families and of those countries. However, the conditions, like Carlos was saying, of the farm workers in this country could be improved. And perhaps there would be more people wanting to work in agriculture. It is very hard. We were just talking about this earlier, about how uh, it is that, well, what are some of the solutions to do away with such uh, uh, harsh working conditions? There's a lot of changes in terms of uh, uh, protections, uh, both for the employers, but also especially the, those protections that, that um, help farm workers themselves be able to know what their rights are. And, and you know, we find that, like Carlos said, they're, they don't provide water, toilets, sometimes they're paid in cash, there's no social security, uh, there's no workers' compensation. And so I think that the population, because it is hidden from the mainstream, uh, we see them. We, 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 if we drive down the Mesilla Valley, we see them in the fields. But I don't think people take a second look to see the, the actual conditions under which the workers are in. And what do you think are some of the ways that we can improve that for them? Well, there's a lot of ways, but some of the solutions that I, th I think uh, that might work is to change some of the policies and, and, and really provide more protections for the farm workers themselves. Uh, New Mexico does not uh, provide for protection for workers' comp uh, for the farm workers. Neither do the domestic workers you know, get workers' comp, but, but particularly farm workers are not protected under workers' comp. That would be one. The minimum wage okay, for farm workers is based on the national trends, and even though there's a higher minimum wage for the state, farm workers are exempt from that. And so there's a lot of other things that, that, that we were talking about earlier um, th that it, it's a whole package of, of, of policy changes that need to be in place for the protection of farm workers and their families, because we're concerned about the health of the families, the family members. If, if they don't have enough income, they don't have uh, sometimes uh, other types of benefits, um, you know, health benefits, housing, adequate housing, affordable housing, and so everything is, has a ripple effect on their quality of life. And I think, uh, Carlos, you mentioned this, the average farm worker is employed about 25 weeks a year, and a few earn more than $60,000 a year. How does one family put food on the table? Six thousand dollars. How does a, a family put food on the table with that? Uh, uh, the farm workers' families they have to rely in, on on assistance from the from nonprofit agencies. You know, it's an irony that, for example, the farm workers' center last year we provided food for close to 5,000 farm workers. I mean, people who pick our food, who produce our food, uh, did not have food for to feed their families. So. Uh, uh, they uh, they lack housing. For example, eight out of ten farm uh, seven out of ten farm workers lack a permanent place to live. Most of the farm workers and the farm workers' families uh, only are only able to afford a place to live during the during the agriculture season. During the winter, there's no agricultural activity, therefore there's no income. So a lot of them will go to live with relatives, mm -hmm. with families, and some of them go back home, back home to Mexico. So uh, the situation is, is really bad. Uh, as Diana, uh, Dr. Bustamante said, you know, uh, consumers also have a moral responsibility to make sure that farm workers are treated better are treated in a fair way. 
uh, we eat three times a day and and when we do that the way that we do it have an impact upon the lives of farm workers and in, and it can be a negative or a positive income uh, we have to remember every day that our food is produced by people who suffer uh, uh, low wages, bad working conditions, and therefore, as consumers, we should demand, you know, uh, the, uh, what uh, Dr. Bustamante say, enforcement uh, of laws and regulations that protect farm workers, but also policy changes to make sure that they enjoy the same rights and benefits that other sectors of our labor force already enjoy. Let's talk about um, these individual farm workers. Uh, many people assume that they are undocumented individuals, but some are not, right? The majority of the farm workers in, the, in this area are legal workers. They are either United States citizens of Mexican origin or legal residents. Used to be a large undocumented labor force, but in 1987 and in 1988, we had an amnesty program in this country that also included a special program for farm workers. Right, these are agricultural workers. And a lot of the farm workers were able to become legalized. And, and they stay in agriculture because it's their life, is what they have done in Mexico. A lot of them were campesinos or ejidatarios, or even children of farm workers or ejidatarios. And they continue to work in the field. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we still treat uh, uh, agriculture the way that we used to treat agriculture during the early years of the last century. Agriculture in this country used to be a small scale family farm produ production where all the family, all the family of the farmers will work the land and they will hire through three or five persons to help you know, during the intensive months of the year. R right now, agriculture is a huge commercial, multi-million dollar industry, and is based on the exploitation of workers. Why most of the farm workers are from Mexico? And I, I, th I think that Dr. Bustamante uh, touched the reason. Agriculture is a kind of a, an unpredictable uh, industry, you know, like right now we have a, a drought, mm -hmm. so there's less production. The North American, your North American average person prefer a steady kind of job. And agriculture is not, you know, it's dependent upon um, nature, the market. So that's why we relied on Mexican immigrants to do that job. And, and they've been doing this for years. During the Bracero program between 1942 and 1964, we brought five million Mexicans to work in agriculture. Can you talk a little bit about the impact? Um, you mentioned uh, about the, uh, the drought, and because of the drought, there's hardly any production, so these workers aren't able to, to work. What do they do? Where's the help? Well, like Carlos said, a lot of them are on, in assistance, yeah. um, looking for assistance. Uh, food stamps and other types of, of uh, subsidies, but they live mostly with families who are working part-time in whatever they can. Uh, people are very resilient, I think, people in, in, in the rural areas, in the areas that we work in, um, are very resilient and find ways uh, to, to find a means of, of income. Um, and, and I'm not talking about a black market or a clandestine, you know, uh, industry, but in, but 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 they they sow, they cook, they they cater food, they they do yard work, they do whatever they can, they paint, they do you know, uh, I mean whatever they can, and, and I think that that's what happens, you know, with when people don't have a steady income. Uh, what's important also is that during those periods of of, of unemployment, uh, there are no other ways in which they can uh, uh, provide for their families. And I think that ha there has to be a mechanism so that uh, there has to be a steady income for the family. Uh, health insurance, you know, uh, affordable housing is, are the things that, I mean, those expenses keep on incurring and incurring. So there has to be a way to, to help the families 
to maintain a stability and economic stability throughout the year because it helps not only their own health but but uh, you know just just in terms of their mental health also and speaking of um, health um, four of five farm workers do not have employer provided health insurance what and it's and working out in the field what are some of the maybe diseases that they may uh, may, may get while working in the field well, diseases and injuries. I think that we need to talk about accidents, injuries, and diseases. Right. Uh, long term, uh, you know, we're talking about you know people who are who are bending down all day, uh, who have back problems, people who are, you know, as a child farm worker, we were sprayed with pesticides, you know, so that still happens, mm -hmm. and if not over <laughs> over us, right. they're they're in the water. Um, and, and there's a lot of protections, you know, that need to be uh, in place for for uh, uh, making sure that, that the farm workers are not exposed to a lot of pesticides. So those have long-term effects. And, and I, I know that uh, Carlos has worked, you know, with the pesticide education. Um, we have in the past, um, but but the injuries, you can talk about the types of injuries and the accidents that, that the farm workers are more prone to. Yeah, well, right now, <coughs> uh, as Dr. Bustamante said, uh, the, the problem is with the, uh, because uh, they try to make as much as, as they can with the few days of work available. They try to work very intensive in order to make uh, In agriculture, they get paid on a piece rate basis. Uh, they don't get paid by the hour. They get paid by the amount of buckets of chili they make or the um, or the amount of sacks of onions they can fill so that creates a situation where the farm workers if he knows that they're, they they're, there's going to be only two or three days of work during the week he will try to make as much as he can that creates many accidents in the fields now the problem, most of the farm, the, the farmers and the uh, agriculture corporations or companies, agribusiness, they actually don't have uh, insurance for the workers. The, what we have here is a system where the employers hire a farm labor contractor. They, pay, they issue one check under the name of the labor contractor and they take, they leave to, up to the labor contractor to, to comply with the laws and regulations that protect farm workers. That creates a situation where nobody is responsible to what happened to the workers. And I, I'm sure this discussion can continue, uh, will continue, I should say. But uh, let's talk about The Harvest. It's a uh, film documentary slash fundraiser that's coming up um, at Doniana Community College, correct? Yes, it is. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the work behind it and why are you um, putting this together, organizing it? Well, if, if farm workers are not protected uh, under labor laws, children who work in the farms are less protected compared to other uh, kids, youth who work in retail and restaurants and you know any kind of food industry. Uh, so, so, so if you think the farm worker issue is problematic, for adults, it's even more problematic for the children who work in the fields. So, so this this uh, film is about um, what happens when children follow the crops. Uh, they're migrant farm workers. I think there's three families uh, that, that are um, part of the story. Um, and, and Mr. Romano, who's a filmmaker, has done a lot of work internationally on child labor, um, exploited slave labor, but child labor in general. And I think that this, is, this, this m film captures what happens with agriculture, uh, even though he, he covers other areas. And we hope to have an opportunity to, to have a discussion with him uh, about the other uh, work that he's done. And this event is taking place Saturday, August 6th, uh, from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Doña Ana Community College Auditorium at the East Mesa campus. And folks can call 575-647-2744 uh, for more information. What do you want people to get from coming to this event? We want, we, uh, we want people to understand that the plight of the farm workers 
which includes children, uh, needs to be looked at in the context of policies, of, of rules, of regulations that protect farm workers. We need uh, to have comparable benefits, health benefits, education for, for farm workers and their families. Um, I think that, that we are particularly concerned about the, the lack of awareness about where the food comes from. Uh, if we drive, again, I mentioned this earlier, we drive down the valley, we see families working full, full family, five, six, seven, eight people picking pecans, uh, working, cutting the, the onions, that ha because of the repetitive motions you know, that, that they're involved in, have long-term effects uh, physically. And to really have people think about that, and what are they going to do? How are they going to help promote um, the, the protection for the farm workers, but to have fair wages, to have fair working conditions for farm workers and their families? All right, and we encourage everyone to participate in this great event. Dr. Bustamante and Carlos, thank you so much for being here. Thank you thank for you, having sir. us. All right, and thank you for joining us. Remember, you can see this entire interview online at krwg.org. While you're there, you can visit our blog, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. I'm Carlos Correa. Until next time.